Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Sir Vince Cable has a reputation as a somewhat pessimistic, if op often accurate, economic guru, but he's now almost certain to be the new Lib Dem leader. Now, I don't want to be rude, Sir Vince, but it doesn't seem as if anybody else actually wants the job. Well, we, we'll it seems. I mean, I, there's no competition at the moment, but, um, you know, I'm happy to take the job if that's what comes along. So, Gordon Brown, mm -hmm. um, coronation. Theresa May, mm -hmm. coronation, mm -hmm. Sir Vince Cable. Is there a bit of a lesson of history here? Well, I think the last Lib Dem who got in on a coronation was Joe Grimmond, actually. He was a great role model, in fact. But I don't, I don't think that's terribly relevant. I well, mean, I, I, I think, you know, I'm actually very optimistic about what I and a very good team of colleagues can achieve. Uh, I mean, I think on the big issues of the day, like Brexit, we're in exactly the right position with long-standing principal position that will become increasingly okay. in line with the mood of the country and as the economy deteriorates. So I'm very optimistic about what we can do. I suppose the serious point is that with a leadership contest, a party has a chance to really look itself in the mirror and have some really hard, take some hard decisions and take a, ch a clear change of direction. And I, I, for instance, are you going to have your own leadership manifesto? Are we going to see the Vince Cable manifesto before you become leader? Yes, you will. And indeed, will I'm working on it at the moment. We have a process in the party, comes to a conclusion in about 12 days' time. And indeed, I will have a manifesto and it will set out what uh, I and my colleagues will, will be able to achieve. Are you in any respect going to lead the Liberal Democrats in a different direction to Tim Farron? Uh, no, Tim did a very good job, you know, built up our membership, created lots of enthusiasm, but the, the situation's moved on, and, and I, I think in two fundamentally different ways from where we were two years ago. Uh, the first is that, of course, the whole Brexit debate now dominates the national agenda, mm. and I will have to approach that consistently with where we were before, but in a different parliament. Uh, and I think the other thing which is different from a couple of years ago is that, that the two major parties were competing with in a very, very fragile state. I mean, the division in the Tory party are palpable and open. Well, the Labour Party is already talking about expelling, you know, 50 of its MPs for ideological deviation. I mean, the, this is a very different world from the one Tim inherited. That was just a Facebook page, really, wasn't it? And presumably they'd be welcoming the Liberal Democrats if they were if they were expelled, but there's no real suggestion of that. Well, we have a generous policy to refugees, and if they come, they will get food and accommodation. But, no, I don't know what will happen, but I think it's, it's, it's a symptom of very, very deep division. On okay. what a fundamental point, because, you know, Jeremy Corbyn had a good election, for sure. Um, but it, th th there is an element of a bubble about it. I mean, he, he managed to attract large numbers of people on the basis that he was leading opposition to Brexit. Actually, he was very pro-Brexit and hard Brexit. And I think when well, that becomes appar apparent, the divisions in the Labour Party will become more real and the opportunity for us to move into that space will be substantial. Let me test you on a few policy areas, if I may, because mm -hmm. one of the things that Jeremy Corbyn did was he enthused young voters, partly by attacking the whole tuition fees yeah. policy. Mm -hmm. Now, you are the man who raised tuition fees to £9,000. Mm. Is your policy to keep it there, to reduce it or to abolish them? Well, it's certainly not to abolish it because the system has actually worked well in many respects. It's kept universities properly funded, it's opened the way to a large number of low-income students, but there are clearly problems with the system. You know, the universities do operate as a form of cartel, there are issues okay. around interest. So I, I, well, I'm certainly up for having a fresh look at it, but I think the point... Are, I you, would... are, you, are you happy with a situation where people from quite uh, humble backgrounds can leave university with a debt of £57,000 and high interest rates? Is that really fair? Um, what is fair, and it, let's remember this is not a system I and my party created. It was well, created, you jacked it, it up. It I mean. was created by Labour government, uh, who promised not to introduce it and did, and promised not to increase it and did, and supported by the Conservatives. Mm. What uh, I did uh, was substantially to raise the threshold. You, tri so it, you tripled so it, 9,000 so pounds. Yes, yeah. I raised the threshold of repayment, mm. so it effectively operates as a form of 
graduate tax mm. and increase the generosity of, of grants for maintenance because of half of this debt is because of maintenance, it's not because of tuition and the Conservative government then abolished that. So there are certainly things that need looking at. The one thing I would stress is that there are 60% of pe young people who don't go to university, they don't get access to the student loan scheme. I've been working with the National Union of Students over the last year looking specifically at further education and that 60%. So if we review this system, and, and I'm certainly up for being open-minded and pragmatic about it, we've got to look at young people as a whole and not just the 40% who go to university. Should taxes overall go up or not? Yes, I think there should be a shift in the balance. Um, Beyond the one penny that the manifesto said? Yes, there should, and indeed we, we spat out in the manifesto how taxes should rise moderately but some of the tax cuts particularly some in the capital side that the Tories have introduced since 2015 we would uh, we would end them so yes I'm, I'm all in favor of fiscal discipline right we've got to you know we've got to reduce the, the deficit on current spending by 1920 it's a legitimate target so in that sense okay. I'm in favor of fiscal discipline but I certainly want to shift the balance away from extreme cuts on public services, which are particularly harsh in local government, and have a bit more tax to balance it. I would also have okay. more financing of public capital investment for housing. On Brexit, do you want Britain to fail economically? I do not want it to fail economically. I don't think the public voted to have cuts in their standard of living. And I think that's why uh, uh, there are two objectives, I think, in the Brexit. Uh, I mean, the reason I ask that, if I may inter interject, is that you have said you have to hang on while the economy deteriorates before the public mood changes, and that's your moment, which makes it sound as if you're going to be kind of an economic eeyore, as it were, observing disaster happening and just waiting for your moment. Uh, no, I think it's not waiting for the moment. There is an imminent issue which is whether the government continues to pursue the so-called hard Brexit, leaving the customs union and the single market. And we've got to work with other people. We did last week. There was a motion in Parliament led by some Labour MPs we supported to try and head off that disastrous outcome. But it may well be that with the situation deteriorating in the economies, I think it will, I mean, none of us are certain, but I think it will, people will realise, well, we didn't vote to be poorer. And I think the whole mm. question of continued membership will once a rain arise. Let me ask you about this, Parliament, because in the end, around 100 MPs mm. or a sixth of the MPs voted for that motion, which suggests the single market issue is now dead for this Parliament. But you are, you've talked about making uh, alliances and talking across parties. Do you begin to see an alliance sufficiently deep into the Labour family and deep into the Tory family as well of pro-EU politicians which is big enough to frustrate Theresa May's ideas on Brexit? Yes, uh, I, I think a lot of people are keeping their heads down. Uh, we'll see what happens in the autumn when people come back. Uh, I, I'm beginning to think that you know, Brexit may never happen. Uh, I think the problems really? are so enormous. The problems are so enormous. The divisions within the two major parties are so enormous. I, I can see a scenario in which this doesn't happen. Uh, and and certainly, you know, it's some, our policy of having a second referendum, which didn't really cut through in the general election, is designed to, to give a way out when it becomes clear that the, the Brexit is, is potentially disastrous. One thing that the party may be getting if they take you as it were as their new leader is experience and wisdom and yet last week you said something extraordinary you compared Theresa May to Hitler that wasn't experience no was no it? I didn't at all I, well, actually, I got, I got, my, look, I got my literary reference wrong I think it was Stalin who talked about rulers cosmopolitans no I was I, I, I thought that particular phrase citizens of nowhere was quite evil it could have been taken out of Mein yeah. Kampf that and, was a silly thing to say wasn't it uh, well if you read the next sentence what I said it was totally out of character and that provided right. the balance in the quote. All right. So, Vince Cable, thank, thank you very you. much, Steve, for talking thank to you. us.